people talk about China, the first thing, what's first pop into their mind? Lots of people. India will have twice the population as China. China is expecting a reduction of more than half of its population. Mao adopted Soviet policy, even adopted the Soviet title, the mother hero title. Especially, you know, all communist countries, every single one, fail to feed its people. Government control the marriage licensing. So women under 24 or men under 27 were not allowed to get married. What happened in China is half of the pregnant at least ended up in abortion. Taiwan's birth rate is even lower than China's. Now, Scott, how would you like to wake up one day and realize that 100 million of your own are missing? Is this what is happening in China? China and its population problem. To understand a little bit more, let's invite our guest of the day, Sasha Gong. Sasha, Namaskar and welcome to P Guru's channel. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here again. You have lovely audience. I always got yes. so many encouraging comments and i'm so so happy the audience loves you sasha they really really like the insights you provide into a civilization they're practically india's neighbors but it's astonishing how little we know about china same same in china you see <laughs> i think of uh, perhaps like uh, less than a dozen real indian experts in china i don't know how many china experts in india yeah, I, I suppose not very many. So, um, Sasha, <laughs> I want to yield the floor to you. Uh, you have done an excellent PowerPoint presentation, as always. And whenever you would like me to start putting up the slides, I will start. The floor is yours. Yeah, let's put the title page on it first. And uh, I want to say a few words on that. Yeah. This is the title of today's subject. It's Population Crisis in China. So, when actually, whenever people talk about China, the first thing, what's first pop into their mind? Lots of people. And uh, not only today, you know, in the past hundred years, people always say, China, wow, the most population in the world. So perhaps in two generations, that will not be the case. India uh, will surpass China. And uh, by the end of this century, India, well, if everything goes the way it goes, India will have twice the population as China. <laughs> Would you like me to move to the next slide? Yes. So let's go to the first one. Yeah. The first one. Currently, we know China actually has its seventh sensor um, in the last year. Actually, let me put this way. And China has this 2021 sensor uh, uh, published uh, some data. And here's what we see. In 2021, China has 1.41 billion people and uh, the change in in 2021 is china has 10.6 million new newborn and uh, with that 10.1 million that means there's a very slight population increase in china but the year of 2020 will 2022 things will change and we'll get into that later the overall picture chinese population in the 40s was less than 500 million. It jumped later after the civil war, after the communists took over, it jumped to 600 to 6.5, uh, 650 million, something like that in the late 50s. But because of the famine, the man-made famine between 1959 to 1962, China's population decreased. Uh, 40 million people died in that famine. More than that, not only 40 million uh, people estimated at least 20 million new uh, born did not get born uh, because, you know, uh, malnutrition and other reasons. So China's population decreased in the three years. And after that, China's population kept growing, growing, growing to sometime like uh, in by the end of the 20th century, it's uh, 1.3 billion people. So China became, well, China has always been the largest uh, population country in the world. And uh, by the end of the 20th century, when China started to grow into a, the workshop of the world, China had plenty of people working on stuff. So that's what we saw in China. 
But with the population decrease, and China is expecting, uh, by the end of this century, China is expecting a reduction of more than half of its population. The government data said by the end of this century, by 2100, China will have 685 million people, which is half the number of India. And China will be surpassed not only by India, but by other countries, including Nigeria in Africa. Nigeria now have about uh, 200 million people, but Nigeria's birth rate is seven times than China's birth rate. Wow. Go ahead. One question, Sasha. One question, Sasha. These numbers that you have computed, were this before or after the Xi Jinping announcement that every family can have three children? Uh, right about the same time, because that's the government censorship time. Uh, well, the first three children is a ridiculous number. <laughs> You all know, and uh, how can you limit if either you let people have the freedom to give birth or, well, whatever policy, but three people actually meant to increase the population, which uh, so far we could see that it's a total failure. And but we are we are getting into that uh, in the uh, next subject. In the let's 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 go review the government policy. Yeah. China's population, China has a very sort of volatile population policy under communists. If you think after 1949, after the establishment of the People's Republic of China, and uh, in the first day, I mean, by all the 50s and part of the 60s, especially in the 50s, China adopted the Soviet policy. Well, Soviet Union lost 27 million of its people. At that time, Soviet Union had about uh, less than 200 million people. And they lost 27 million during the Second World War. So Stalin had a special population policy because of the size of the Soviet Union. And the Stalin has the policy that, well, uh, they would reward uh, women who give birth. So uh, the women who give a lot of birth, like 10 or 11, they have a title after, you know, I, I forgot what's the number, of, but after the women give certain number of births, the woman would be given the title as hero mother. So the hero mother <laughs> policy, well, <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, but that's the policy. Anyway, but it had very limited success in the Soviet Union, what we can see is that Soviet Union's population did not grow that much for other reasons, right? And we are not going into their history. <clears throat> but if, if, if you look at China, in the 1950s, Mao adopted Soviet policy, even adopted the Soviet title, the mother hero title. China had been, had been in war for a long time. Since the fall of the Qing Dynasty in 1911, China was in constant war. The Chinese <clears throat> lost about 20 million people. Since 1911, which was the end of the Qing Dynasty, China had been in constant war after that. So if you look at the population in China, well, loss of population, you look at uh, the Second World War or the eight-year anti-Japanese war, China lost about 20 million or even more. Some researchers would say 30 million, but give or take, say let's say 20 million. And during the civil war, the Chinese, when the communists fought the Kuomintang, the military death is about 8 million, and military and civil civilian. So, so far, we have no idea how many people actually died because of the civil war. So, well, at least we would say it's in the neighborhood of 10 million. And if you put those together, the anti-Japanese war and uh, the Chinese civil war and the wars in the 20s and in the 30s, like uh, between the communists and Kuomintang, between the warlords, the population number is huge, the loss of population. And uh, beyond war, China also had famine. 1942, China had a huge famine in which millions also perished. So if you look at the, the end of Qing Dynasty, when China, of course, at that time, and Chinese population data is not very accurate. But if you look at 450 million, that number in China, compared to the number in, um, let's say, 
based on the government tax records, more than 300 years earlier, China had more than 200 to 200 to 300 million people. So if you look at 300 something years, the population did not increase that much, especially given the fact that, you know, there was no uh, birth limit. Family planning, and if, yeah. Yeah. And if you look at even before that, uh, the population lost in China, the Taiping Rebellion from 1851 to 18. 63, 64, China lost about 70 million people. So and that was due to? Due to a Taiping rebellion. Oh, okay. A rebellion. When we talk about population, population lost in China, the numbers are always staggering. Well, the, during the Black Death, the European lost, uh, you know, it's a medieval number. Europe, the European lost about one third to 40% of its population. So if you look at China, China has been suffering such population loss for a very long time. So traditionally, the Chinese family prefer having lots of children. And that time, the Chinese, traditionally, Chinese always said, to give birth to more children, you have more children, it's happening. And the children to a traditional family is the only uh, insurance policy. So if you look at population policy under Mao, it's mostly encourage people to give more birth. Believe, uh, Mao's firm belief is uh, more people, more hands, and uh, you, uh, you have more power. The country has more power. One problem when you are under a communist system especially you know all communist countries every single one fail to feed its people it's the known fact think of ukraine during the great famine in 1933 ukraine lost six million people and ukraine is supposed to be the bread basket of Europe it lost people in a big famine without any major foreign invade or major uh, disaster. It, the disaster is Stalin. So in that time, if you look at the population ratio, it's astonishing. In China also. So in the 1970s, after great failure in agriculture, China had a problem of feeding its people. You know, traditionally that was a problem, but you know, uh, in peaceful years, it was never a problem. But communism made that a problem. So I remember, you know, I grew up in those years, starvation it was just, well, it's norm, <laughs> as they <laughs> Well, my I remember my brother when my brother was a kid. He said, "Gosh, uh, well, if we actually got into communism, communist society would have enough meat to eat." That was our childhood dream, <laughs> to have enough meat. Because in that time, if uh, well, in my childhood in the nineteen sixties and nineteen seventies, the Russian, uh, the Chinese Russian. Well, I remember I lived in that time in the 70s, I lived in a rich city. The peasants had much worse ration. So I ration is that uh, you have uh, like 30 pounds of grain, uh, rice or flour and other things every month. But you have uh, less than two pounds of meat every uh, pork that no beef it was available. Uh, one less than two pounds and less than 500 in American pounds that half a pound of uh, cooking oil and everything else was Russian. So under that Russian system, sugar, uh, just think about anything eatable was rationed in the 1970s. We so had the, the same problem in India. We had the same really? problem in India. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Under whose rule? <laughs> It's uh, uh, Indira Gandhi. Indira Gandhi, Mrs. Indira, Indira Gandhi. Gandhi. She was a she I was a died in the wool socialist. socialist. She was yes. so much Russia. You know, there, we had a joke happen. Uh, I have to tell you this joke because many Indians may also not know this joke. Joke meaning like you know something very funny. India was so much aping Soviet rules. You know, Leonid Brezhnev. Brezhnev died, right? Mm -hmm. And after yeah. Brezhnev, who succeeded him? Andropov. Remember that? Yeah. Twelve. The KGB twelve days. Had. General Secretary, 12 days, right? Uh, I mean, okay, very, very short amount of time. He was sick even before he became a president. One year. He assumed, Chernenko succeeded yeah. him in one year. Right, one year. 
So when he died, again, India said, so every time there is a general secretary, like the main key guy in Russia dies, India would declare 12 day mourning. There was only one wow. radio channel, only one TV channel. And the whole time it will be like patriotic songs or some dull music, you know, uh, 12 days, day in and day out. There was only one channel then, one TV channel, one radio channel. <laughs> then Andropov died and Russia for some reason said only three days of mourning. India still did 12 days. Oh. It was ridiculous, ridiculous what you used to do. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, yeah. But anyway, so when you, when, when there's a shortage of food, what the population problem became a different problem. Too many mouths to feed. So in the 50s, when Mao promotes uh, this Russian type of population policy, the theory was, well, you have more hands to work, have more power. And in the 70s, it became, gosh, there are too many mouths to feed. So in the mid 1970s, the Chinese government started another policy. In that time, jobs were not readily available. Government control all the jobs. And uh, if you give birth to more children, there was housing shortage. Uh, well, housing shortage was so severe that in Shanghai, for example, uh, in the 1970s, in early 1980s, every person lived in, well, every square meter resident had at 1.9 square meter for each person. That means it's enough only for one bed, for one it's, person. It's it's the stretching of my arm. I'm just going to go full, full screen for one right. minute and I'm going to show how much 1.8 meters is. It is less than 1. this. 1.9, nice. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. So if you think some, if somebody's like uh, six feet tall, well, that would not be enough for the guy to lie down. It is that simple. Anyway, so in that time, the Chinese began to change its population policy. First, I remember in the 1970s, under Mao, the, the, the last few years of Mao, what they do is that first they change not really change there was no the chinese law said women could get married when they reach 18 and a man 20 right so they extended that limit in beijing for example in the 70s they changed the uh, marriage because government control the marriage licensing so women under 24 or men under 27 were not allowed to get married and uh, other cities in my city in Canton, it was 23 at 26. But somehow in that time, government used very strong policy, punitive policy, like uh, uh, deny marriage license and that to push the marriage back. You know, uh, traditionally the Chinese would, you know, especially in, in rural area, girls would get married at 16 and the boys 18. The government tried to push it late in order to reduce the population growth. So what happens that the harsh policy, I can give you one example. I know some people in, in the city that time, I know a girl who was 22 uh, who got pregnant, which itself was illegal. She got pregnant for eight months and was discovered and they forced her to give an abortion. Oh so God. eight months, well, that's, well, you have Say you have to wait until you reach 24 and then you get married you get you give birth so that was in the in the in the in the 1970s but people in the rural area still give birth and as much as they want but when people are under starvation all the time they just don't it's very simple you can't feed because you know in traditional society when people give birth a family they will say hey we have more hands to work. But under a communist system, you don't own anything. You have no land, you have nothing. So peasants, lots of peasants don't see any reason to give birth to more children at that time. And if you look at the population growth in China, think of it, China has, like the United States, like the whole world, had a huge baby, baby boom in the 1950s. The reason is that that was the first time for a long time China was peace, no war. So people and the government encourage people to give more birth. And you have a huge population boom. And the, the, pop, the boomers reach its uh, marriage 
and the childbirth age in the 70s and the, and the 80s. And the government realized the population grow very fast to the level that beyond their ability to feed. So the child government started to inject what the uh, late marriage and the limited child policy in the 80s. In the early 80s, we see the government had the one child policy that started to take effect in city. And in that time, it was very hard for the Chinese people, especially for the peasantry who just got their land from the reform. And they wanted to give more births, but the government started to put down the, the policy. So in that time, in the 1980s, when the government started and the people still tried very hard to avoid government policy. In the beginning, the government put on fine to each, uh, each birth. Uh, I know like villages, uh, well, they would find 1,000 yuan for each, for each child. In the 80s, 1,000 yuan, that, let me see the, the amount. 1,000 1, yuan that time, my salary as, uh, as a college graduate was 64 yuan per month. Wow. So 1,000 yuan is a huge amount. 16 times. Yes. And uh, the fines in the fine increase increased to the level that you know, well, in that time China began to have some free travel. So people travel to other places to give birth, and uh, well, in and in that time the government has a huge problem. How do they calculate the real population? They did not know the real population. So in order to avoid that, and uh, the government implemented the one child policy using this his its dictatorship the, what the government did was very very brutal they mobilized organizations like uh, government or communist party organizations to every level to intervene with family with local people and they organized a force this was a very powerful force to monitor people and that if you have one child, one child only. So the monitor people, you have, uh, you, if you have more children, not only you'll be fined when you are discovered, they will force you to abortion. And yeah, I, I give you my, uh, my own story, story of my own family. My sister-in-law is actually American citizen, went back to live in China when she had her, uh, when she was pregnant with her second child and neighbors did not know she was American citizen. So they reported her and uh, the party or, you know, the organization, the government sent a team to knock on her door and would force her, drag her and would force her to give abortion. She, well, she heard of it and uh, she took her American passport out and did not open her door, only open a little bit and show the American passport. So that actually helped her to avoid being forced abort uh, her child. And that's where the result is my, uh, it's my niece. And I love my niece. I always joke with her, say, hey, you are a survivor of one child party. So anyway, that's the harsh method. And that method was carried out in China in the 1990s, in the 2000s, and carried out for uh, more than one generation. Until one day when China got rich relatively, and one day a few years ago, the Chinese say, hey, something's happening to our population. The Chinese government realized it's, well, it's not right. Because starting from 2008, 2009, and suddenly the Chinese factories have problem to recruit new workers. So China had this, they call it shortage of workforce. The Chinese suddenly realized, hey, what's happening? In the beginning, people blame, you know, uh, those who got married early, say, well, those people got married and they carry children, they don't want to work. So instead of easing the population policy, they, the, around the year 2000, 2010 and the later, they actually strengthened the one-child policy stupidly and they forced people to give abortion. So what happened in China is half of the pregnancy, at least, ended up in abortion. It's a huge number. And, but if we calculate of the illegal ones and register ones, I would say, well, perhaps more than half of the pregnant ended in abortion. And that's what happened until, and then later, like 
two or three years ago, the Chinese say, hey, not right. They first realized China it was shortage of labor. That did not change them. But what changed them is that suddenly China realized the population is getting so old. The old population demand pension, retirement, and all that they could not feed it. And China is now officially, according to the new data, China has 264 million uh, popu- people over 60. And officially, China has the oldest population, oldest population, and China has the largest old population, old people. So China's life expectancy is about uh, 76 years old, 76, which is, I think, longer than the India population. So what happened is the Chinese government got almost panicked. They said, hey, let's change the policy. So first, a few years ago, they eased up the one-child policy. Hey, now you are allowed to have two children. Well, people say, so allowed, so what? It's still expensive to raise children. The whole generation changed. And then last year, the Chinese government said, okay, now you are allowed to have three children. But if you have more, we are not going to punish you. So officially, you know, one way the Chinese still, the Chinese government still refused to recognize their mistake or crime for years of the one-child policy is a crime to the nation. On the other hand, the Chinese wanted to push more births. People simply, you know, did not work. So I'm going to a new slide. Two structural problems in China. The two major structural problems in China. First, the population gets very old. As I said, it's 264 million people are over 60. And that number will increase by the year 2030. China will have over 300 million people over 60. And meanwhile, the Chinese population, China, the, the population itself will be shrinking. When the population is shrinking, when the older population keep growing, that's a major, major problem for the whole country. And uh, the other structural problem was sex ratio. What governments recognize the data is that the sex ratio is 105. What means 105? It means, well, every every girl uh, were born and every every 100 girls were born, 105 boys were born. But that, that was the official data, but I believe that was the questionable data. Because if you look at the local data, and the worst data I saw was 123 boys and 100 girls. And what happened is that, well, the ratio reached its peak in uh, the early 2000, like 20, 20, uh, 2005 and those years because the technology, yeah, the, the fetal, uh, it's the sex, well, it decides the, the sex of the fetus, it gets very advanced, especially in China. So even within three months, the first trimester, you would know that's a boy or a girl. The people selectively abort their children, their, their boy, girls. And uh, in some less advanced area and poor area, they simply abandon the girl. Give birth to a girl, you just abandon her. That's why what we saw is that China has a huge, you know, abandoned girl problem. So with that, the register number, I look at the local number, well, before 2010, the sex ratio number was about 100 to 116. That means even the Chinese government recognized in the millennium age, a millennium is 34 million extra Chinese men who, who had very little perspective to find a wife. It's, it's a huge problem. And when you think of those, uh, those single horny men without a wife, well, everybody would, would be a little frightened to bet that picture. And around the year of 2010, the Chinese had outlawed the technology and strictly forbid people to conduct such tests. But still people do that and they still selectively abort their children. So the sex ratio is getting <clears throat> a little better, but not the birth rate. Let's go to the next. Funny, we, we are looking for the another extreme. This is uh, the Chinese, actually there's a cultural revolution poster and people are making fun of it. The word under there is that unless, unlike the earlier poster would say, 
give birth to the second child, you'll be uh, arrested, you'll have to abort your second fetus. And, and this one, I have to make sure this is someone make fun of it, is that uh, you reward the second child and punish those who only give, give birth to one. And if you're not married, or if I'm married and not having children, you got a, we, we would arrest you, that sort of thing. <laughs> but that's this kind of mentality, the Chinese mentality, you know, for the whole generation, because abortion was so readily available and forced. Because of the abortion readily available and government encouraged, the government forced abortion. So Chinese women, especially young women, well, have abortion so much. As I said, 50% of the pregnancy or even higher ended up in abortion. So a frequent abortion caused one problem to the young generation. Those who had experience of abortion, 18% of Chinese women who had abortion also suffered infertility. Where problem few people actually discuss the infidelity problem anyway. And also people now, since the government started this late push the marriage age to late years, lots of people got used to not getting married. And you know, Chinese society has changed so much. And uh, in the age of my my time, when I was in my uh, 20s, uh, premarital sex was basically banned. You can't do that. Although, of course, in any society that happened, but it was it's so immoral. Few people actually dare to try it. But now nowadays, premarital sex was a norm. Everybody does it, and nobody frowned on, upon it. And then young men especially got very little reason to rushed into marriage. So if you look at China, China in the uh, 1970s, the marriage age, the average marriage age is about 22. Now, the first marriage age, 29. Uh, we are not even getting into the divorce rate and uh, that, all that rate. But that pushed China into a very, uh, how do I say, very difficult area. Because, you know, the population problem around the world is, but let's uh, let's still go back to the, the replacement fertility rate ratio. The rate you see population. If want we want to keep our current population, the country, you know, the size of the country, you need well each couple give at least two point one. Yes, each, two point one is uh, the accepted formula. Two point one, because well, but even you have two point one in modern society, there are some factors which you know, uh, would not, but that would not be enough to replace the, uh, the debt, uh, population of that because more and more people elect not to get married and not to have children. So in China, if you look at the entire population and if we look at the women in the birth giving age, the actual replacement rate experts believe is only 1.1 to 1.2, which was the same rate as Taiwan and uh, Korea after they got rich and uh, women stopped to give, giving children. In China, even before China got rich, uh, women in cities stopped giving birth to children. And uh, the official now China rely very much on uh, the rural areas like America relies so much to the population problem, rely so much on uh, the Latinos, uh, uh, the, the Catholic or the conservative people. And China rely on its rural population to keep the population there. But there's a huge problem. China, uh, in history, no country had experienced such rapid urbanization than China. And well, in my age, in the 1980s, they're talking about China, 80% of China's population a peasants, rural area. And um, according to last year's census, China, 900 million Chinese. According to last year's census, look at this, uh, 900 million Chinese live in urban areas. Only 500 million Chinese live in rural areas, which means the giving fewer birth populations is growing rapid or the population to tend to more stable, give more birth. A shrinking. So we are actually looking at a very long term problem here. And what's the long term problem? Let's go to the last page. 
last pages, first and foremost, China, the population in China gave China, the, it's the engine actually, the population in China is the engine of Chinese workshop of the world. We all know China produced for the whole world and that was developed in the past 40 years or 30 years. If you look at Chinese factories, they depend on young workers. Uh, I, I work for AFL-CIO for a few years and uh, I represent them to go to Chinese factories and look at this. At that time, a few factories like shoe manufacturer and the electronic manufacturer, the average 80, I'm talking about uh, 2006 and seven in, in that time, the average age of Chinese workers is less than 20 and depends on which industry, like the shoe industry in that time was uh, 19 or 18 years old. I found a lot of 14 years old working in factory. I asked them, actually, I talk in their local dialect and uh, they reported to the boss, they, they reached 16 and in fact, they were 14. And very motivated because they live in rural areas and that was their only opportunity to have a job and to earn their income. I, I, I did a survey in that time because, you know, American labor movement often accused, you know, China using slave labor. And I interviewed a bunch of female workers. I asked them, why do you want to work in a factory? Look at the working condition and you have to work all the time, and especially in a shoe industry or garment manufacturing. You have 80% or even more uh, percentage of the workforce of female and you only have 20% of male. You have no, can't, can't even find anyone to date, right? I got very interesting answers from all those young women. They told me that, hey, listen, if we remain in, our, in rural areas, our father, our parents will arrange our marriage. And I'll be forced to marry to someone for the, you know, dowry, the Chinese, you know, in the Chinese custom, it's the man who gave the dowry, right? So we'll be sold, we'll be sold basically. If we come to the factory, we earn our salary, we could save some money, and I could pick the man I get I married to. I said, interesting. That means freedom. I said, yeah, that means freedom. So they basically uh well pay their freedom, marriage freedom, with their you and with their very hard work. In that time, if you look at the Chinese workers, you could not believe how hard they work. I, I was I myself was once a young female worker. I was one of those workers. I know it's boring. I, I worked in such a shop for seven years, believe or not. So I do know, I do know them. But the workforce in China was very motivated at that time. Men or women, young men and young women, they came from rural areas and came to the city. And, uh, but things changed because all these people, you know, the Chinese government was supposed, you should, after you work, say you have no permit to live in cities and the factories, allow you to live in factory dorm. When you reach 25, you're no, you may no longer employed and you are supposed to go back to your village to live there. That's your insurance, that's your retirement. And lots of more and more young people say, hey, how about I don't want to go back to the village. There's nothing for me in the village. I want to live in city. I want to go, to go to shopping centers. I want to, uh, well, walk on the street, I want to date and here, I just don't want to go back to cities. And that actually more and more people are choosing that route. And what happened? What happened is that when you see all the, the workforce chosen that route and uh, they, they became urban, they became urban residents. They live in urban areas. And what happened to people live in urban areas? People live in urban areas compared to those living in countryside. They get married late and they don't want to give birth to that many children. One child is fine and, and even, you know, for the, this generation of young people, why not? They don't need that many children. They have housing problems, they have income problems, and schools in cities are expensive and everything is expensive. And the children would not give you anything, un unlike if you live in a village, you have more sons and they help you to work in the field and all that. 
in urban areas, what can you expect from your children? Almost nothing. So people stop giving birth. And uh, if you look at Chinese population, the interesting part is that the baby boomers gave baby boomers, my generation, baby boomers gave birth to the hard workers. The hard workers, you know, working class now said, why should why should we give birth to more and why should we work hard? Because it's endless work. So in China, among the young people, the funny thing is that it, it's, there are several uh, movements in China. The first, they call that anti-996 move, which is 996, which means you work from nine from the, in the morning until nine in the night and work for six days. That's 996. They said, no, 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 we don't want that anymore. And then someone or spontaneously launch another movement called lying flat, lying down, lying flat. We all lie flat. We just earn the minimum. Why should we? Why should we work that hard? So suddenly what happens that when you, when you see the, this generation suddenly said, hey, well, we don't want to work so hard. We don't want to work in factory. We want to work in service industry, which gives us more flexibility. Or we want to work in, well, whatever, go to college. So beginning in the, uh, about 10 years ago, the Chinese said, hey, well, if we have that problem, perhaps we can train them better. Maybe that's a training problem. So the Chinese expanded their college, dramatically expanded their college system and recruited a lot of young people. And there's a good money making business as well. After graduation, now the young people graduated. They said, why should we work on assembly line? Doesn't make sense. We want to work in, we want white color job. Not that many white color jobs are available. So now 18% of China's graduate, and that's the government data. 18% of the young college graduate could not find a job. Meanwhile, factory could not find workers and uh, everything, the price went, shoot up. And the government said, hey, perhaps you guys should give more birth. And the people said, don't think so. And now China stopped. So there's amazing stuff. The economy is going down. The workforce is also going down. And for even those who have a, a bachelor's degree, they don't have enough jobs for that. Yeah. How is China still managing to put up a superhero front? Well, we have to say technology change also improves that much. So uh, starting from uh, when the population, when the workforce shortage problem happened, and China started to develop automa more automation. Now, if you go to a China's factory and uh, you will see uh, the AI technology is widely used and uh, the automation is very well underway. And then the problem would be a little different in the future. Well, perhaps you have enough workers. How about the old people who want to retire? And uh, well, we are talking about peacetime. How about if a war broke? If a war ha happened, break, a uh, war break, where are you going to find your soldier? Perhaps the 34 million unmarried men, <laughs> but we don't know. We really don't know. But this is the major problem China is facing. Uh, wow. Viewers, I hope you understand that you have actually got a glimpse of how China developed population wise in the last 60, 70 years. And more importantly, the kind of things that have gone wrong inside China. And even if they annex Taiwan, they're not going to get the people, the population. So these are all basically ways to distract the people, in my opinion. Sasha Ji, you can agree with me or you can disagree with me please answer that and then yeah. we can call this a wrap and you think of it taiwan's population also face the same population problem yes. Ta taiwan's taiwan's birth rate is even lower than china it's not even close to the replacement ratio that that's a problem in all the industrial countries and plus you know china and uh, i i is that a problem in same problem in india or no or uh, not that not like that. India has a slightly different problem, uh, Sasha. What India's problem mm -hmm. is, is the country is growing approximately at 1.6%. However, one minority is growing at 2.4%. And that mm -hmm. minority is no longer a minority. Uh, India's population is 1.36 billion. In fact, it might be already more populous than China. 
and 200 of those are Muslims and they are growing at 2.4 percent mm -hmm. and they also have the choice of having four wives and and this is really really you know thrown the thrown a spanner into the works but the organization of Islamic countries who themselves will put limitations on how many wives a man can have or the West which thinks that you know everybody should have only one spouse they will not look at this they always say an outright lie that the minorities are being discriminated yesterday there was a video sasha of a tailor being attacked by two muslims with machetes and he was hacked to death and one of them was actually taking a picture of that i'll a video of that i'll send it to you here's a tailor getting ready to measure one of the guys he signs with his eye now let's start he starts filming it and this guy starts hacking him and he's dead father of a family only breadwinner now everybody's trying to you know have a funding but the problem is these people are nuts and you know who i blame for this sasha mm -hmm. a certain congresswoman called ilan umar these people are very conscious about how muslims are doing outside of india and they don't think you know country they don't have this order of the world right you know, in order of the world, you are a human being first. You are the citizen of a certain country. Then you live in a particular state. You you speak a certain language. Then it's your religion. Religion is something that's personal. For some, yeah. this has come to the top. Mm -hmm. And and this is what is being taught taught in their things called as madrasas, which are religious schools. And there, the first thing that they have taught is anybody who's not practicing Islam is a kufar, kafir, K-A-F-I-R. And they should be killed. Mm -hmm. You see, so India, that's the, India? yeah, that's the Europe. Most European countries, especially Western Europe, are suffering with the same problem. Exactly, exactly. And and but the, you think, see, see what Miss Omar has done. She's actually whenever they put this thing right, they immediately the whole population thinks, oh my God, I don't know, but somewhere in India somebody is doing this. Oh, I need to fight back. See, these kinds of insecurities are being flamed by idiots here. And how did she get oh, to wow. know that? There is an organization called USCIRF, which is completely captured by Islamic elements. And they keep feeding these lies. The report on India was written by a Pakistani person. There, even though there's an Indian person in USCIRF, that person doesn't write about India. See, I, mm -hmm. I mean, I can go on, Sasha. India is getting royally screwed right now by the United States. And I don't know, you know when this thing is going to stop. Biden knows it. Even the Secretary of State, Blinken, knows it. But he still chooses to report from this flawed, you know, cho chooses to make comments based on this flawed report. They all know it. They just want to put, put uh, uh, India under pressure. Why? Because India didn't tow their line when it came to the war against uh, Russia. So it, it, it's a complex equation. It is not just this one factor yeah. alone. But but the thing is, India actually is running away still with population, especially what is afraid, what people are afraid is, Pew Research says, once the Muslim population in a country exceeds 30%. It cannot be reversed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so we are actually looking at London became a Muslim city. We are looking at Paris and Brussels. You know, the number one newborn name in Brussels is Mohammed. So that yes. says something. And in Germany, we are actually looking at it. Well, uh, you know, the population problem, uh, that would be the major problem in the next step. In, in the entire Europe. Only two countries, you know, everybody's birth ratio went down and in only two countries managed to reverse the trend. One is Hungary. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban since 2010, well, put in the policy to encourage family, to encourage patriotism, to encourage so he got attacked by the West by the Western, le Western leftists. And the other country, interestingly, is Russia. And Putin put down the same policy in, in, since 2012. Uh, a few days ago, Putin announced one uh, interest, had one very interesting announcement uh, with the White, you know, White House had the same announcement. White House announced, announced that they would have a transgender right day or something. And Putin announced that Russia will have a family day. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, you, this is a serious problem and the population problem, and um, I'm not pro this, pro that. But if we don't look, don't take care of our own reproduction problem and our own country, our people, we have to reproduce. We have to. Uh, if you think human beings 
a negative asset to the world, like a lot of green people think. You, you, are, you live, so you're negative. And if we think that way, human right, human race is in jeopardy. Yes, indeed. Uh, food for thought. Thank you so much, Sasha. And viewers, if you Thank like, you. share or forward this uh, video, it would really do us a huge favor. And please also click on the bell button for notification. And you will know that Sasha has done a lot of research putting together this PowerPoint presentation, especially for us. So you can express your appreciation by clicking on the super thanks button. Thank you once again, Sasha. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you.